Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Peter Frady, and I am the Associate Dean for Health Sciences here in the college. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences Black History Month series. Thank you for joining us today. I am so delighted to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Roger Husband, who has been with the Mortuary Science Program for some 20 years. And on a sidebar, has been a personal friend of mine for at least that long. Roger is intimately familiar with the history of black funeral homes in the city of Detroit. And amongst his other accomplishments is the embalmer who cared for Miss Rosa Parks. Roger will be joined by Dr. Mark Evely, the director of our mortuary science program. Roger and Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Dr. Frady. And I know Mr. Husband was uh, your student, Dr. Frady, and my teacher. And in addition to that, he's been um, teacher, mentor, and friend to, to so many funeral directors in Michigan. And he, uh, he's well known. I don't know any funeral director that doesn't know Mr. Husband. So his roots run very deep. And I'm I'm very glad that he's able to join us and and talk about not only the history but the cultural importance of black funeral homes in the city of Detroit. So thank you, Mr. Husband, for agreeing to do this. I guess a good place to get started would be how did black funeral homes start in America? Well, first I want to say it, it's a pleasure being here and knowledge is truly not yours exclusive it must be shared so i'm humbled that you have given me the opportunity to be with you this afternoon as many of you all know about uh, african americans and slavery um, when we look at death and you look at the conditions of slaves uh, our hope was in death. We struggled on this side, but we knew that our reward would be on the other side of eternity. So we endured the pain for the reward. And a vital part of that transition was the funeral ceremony. Unfortunately, because we were slaves, some of us were buried in anonymous graves. We were buried on plantations. Some, if we were fortunate enough to worship and have a church, we would be buried in the churchyard. But there's a great similarity uh, with uh, undertakers, just as with, uh, with white uh, directors, they started out as carpenters and building and uh, many uh, uh, blacks took on the same trade and uh, they became the undertakers. Uh, there was always a, a ceremony uh, when you look at the African roots, uh, well, healing, crying, crossing over, all of that was very important. And being in restraint, we still was able to find a way to pay tribute as best as we could. As I said, as slaves, it's limited to what you could do. So what we could do, what we were allowed to do, we did. Sometimes it was just a burial. And sometimes we were able to have some type of service. And were those services did those kind of have to be done in secret or were they sometimes allowed to be public where many people would be able to, to come and participate? It really depends. Uh, you can't see, but I actually have uh, the husband Chris. And when people think of slavery, they think like years and years ago, but to show you how recent it is, my grandfather 
his father was a slave. Now, my grandfather passed in 1973, so his father was a slave. Now, they were, my grandfather was from Nigeria. I'm sorry, my grandfather was from Jamaica. My grandmother was from Nigeria. They were brought as slaves to Tennessee. They were on the husband plantation. And 1867, they got freedom papers. Now, they took their freedom papers and they moved to Mississippi. Mississippi is where my family is from, from the husband plantation. And I have the actual press here at my funeral home. Now, they were fortunate with freedom papers. They could have a serve when death occurred. Those that were still slaves could not. Many of them were unmarked graves. I don't know their actual name. We take the husband name. But all we knew was he was Danny, she was Susie. So sometimes it would be unmarked in the husband section or the Johnson section, or it would be simply one name, not their last name. And jumping the broom was real because they jumped the broom. A lot of us still take that tradition, but that was real. But I remember my grandfather, and he talked about his father who was a slave. So when you look at it, 200 years is really not that long ago. And when you look at where we are today, it's not ancient because you still see remnants of those times. And when, you know, your, your grandparents had freedom papers and were allowed to have a service, would they have been taken care of by an African-American funeral director? Or when, when did the first African-American funeral home really, really start in America? That is really not documented, but just to give you a little bit of history, okay, we all know his professor was Thomas Home. Dr. Thomas Home is the father of modern day environment. Okay. We know that there's three uh, periods of environment the Egyptian, which is African American, because the continent of Egypt is in Africa. We know that. So when you go back to the Egyptians, and what they deal with natron, that's the early part of environment. And the whole idea is the other world, the new world, where we're taken over from our old world to our new world, to paradise, to heaven. Okay, then you have the anatomist. We know about that. Thomas Holmes, Dr. Thomas Holmes, is what we do, modern day environment. And he's definitely uh, honorable, but you can't mention Thomas Holmes without mentioning Pr uh, Prince Greer. Because Prince Greer learned the trade of embalming, the modern day embalming, and he was a slave. And when he became free, the way that he got room and board was to do uh, work during the Civil War, and bombing soldiers. Because just as now, then, we always want to go back home. So all of those services from the Civil Rights, from the, from the Civil War, that was a desire for them to be brought home. And an intricate part of that was Prince Greer. We almost have to give him as much credit as Dr. Con Thomas Holmes, because he embalmed probably as many bodies. Now, segregation is nothing new. And when we go back, it was the same way. It's strange how in death, there's still division. And it was segregated then. Yes, and that's that's a very good point. It's 
it's still very much that way today where you don't see a crossover in terms of of funeral homes and that that is a very interesting observation and i think many people don't don't realize that i'll give you an example i went to there was a funeral there was a cemetery that recently uh took new management so he had me come over and see the grounds beautiful cemetery old cemetery and as we walk in the grounds, he said, well, you know, this is a black cemetery. And I says, well, I'm looking at the city. The city is 90% white. And there's four surrounding funeral homes that are all white owned. So when you say black owned, I'm a little confused because you're white. And I'm a little confused. He says, well, you got to understand. The funeral homes identified this as a black cemetery because that's primarily who's buried here. And they still choose not to do that. He says, I'm just being honest. And I was a little surprised. And probably two weeks later, I see a funeral director, white funeral director. And I laughed at myself and I said, oh, he was wrong. So I went over and I'm like, oh, are you burying? He's like, no, we're just burying. So there's true. There was a white funeral home that sold to a, uh, a black funeral director. And some of the contracts said no color. Some of the contracts said white only. What's amazing is you can have a Indian doctor be in a white nursing home, be revived by white paramedics, but you pass and you have to go to a black funeral home or vice versa. I'm fortunate because of my funeral home, I probably say is the others. But I remember um, in the very beginning, when I came to this community, they said uh, Blacks will not cross Michigan to come to Westland. And definitely Whites in Westland are not going to use a Black term. I mean, and that's, that's today in, in 21. I want to talk a little bit about the the importance of funeral service in African American owned businesses. Weren't black funeral homes among the first actually black owned businesses in America? There has always been a marriage. When you look at successful, quote unquote, successful black uh, businesses. One of the top is funeral homes. And there's a marriage between the black funeral home and the black church. Anything that was started business wise, the foundation has always been through the church. So it was always that marriage. And through the church, they supported that black funeral director. That's the, the, the one business that's, that has survived. Just to kind of give you an idea, um, when we look at civil rights, we just, uh, I think Rosa Parks' birthday was either today or yesterday. But when we look at uh, civil rights, and everybody knows about the Montgomery boycott, but one question was never asked. And that question was, if you didn't take the bus and you didn't have a car, obviously you can't walk everywhere. How did people get to work? How did people get to school? And Martin Luther King was a pastor 
And Martin Luther King called A.G. Gaston. And he said, man, we really got something going on down here. And we need your help. And A.G. Gaston said, I don't feel I'm going to do it. I support what you're doing, but how can I help you? What benefit would I have? He said, you got problems. Because a part of our culture is that car. You may not have a car, but when grandma passes, this is the one time that that Cadillac is going to come to the house and take you to church and grandma worship. You have cars, you have a fleet. So they started providing transportation. The lady that could cook, she was going to cook for the repast because she was such a great cook in the church. The tailor that took care of Deacon Seuss, there's a marriage with him and the funeral director. See, it all tied together and they all support one another. I appreciate all that that background. I didn't I didn't know that at all. And I think you've you've set up this discussion well on a national level. I'd like to now focus in and, and talk about Detroit. So tell me, who were the founding fathers of African American funeral homes in the city of Detroit? And when did that start? Okay. James H. Cole, uh, this summer, they will celebrate being in business 102 years. They started in 1918. No, 103 years. They started in 1918. James H. Cole Sr. and his brother, Charles T. Cole Sr. had sons. Charles T. Cole had Charles T. Cole Jr. and James H. Cole Sr. had James H. Cole Jr. James H. Cole Jr. and Charles T. Cole Jr. were first cousins, both funeral directors. We know the history of James H. Cole uh, funeral home. Uh, Carla, well, actually, James H. Cole Jr., second generation. Carla is a uh, third generation third generation, and Bryce and Frankie is fourth generation. Charles H. Cole was on Gratiot and East Grand Boulevard. He passed probably 35 years ago. His kids did not go into the business. Now, that's, that's one, okay? You had three McFalls. You had James McFall, Ben McFall, and George McFall, okay? James and George had a funeral home. No, James and Ben had a funeral home. George had a funeral home. I'm bringing all of this together. Annette Fields, remember I told you my, my family is from Mississippi. They were from Laurel, Mississippi. That's where the husbands were from. Annette Fields was from Laurel, Mississippi. She came up here in the 40s. And she brought the three brothers together. She brought James, Ben, and George. They merged and they formed the Fall Brothers. Okay? Now, House of Diggs. I'm going to name some of the directors at the House of Diggs. Rebecca Barksdale, Ellis Pope, Harold Murray, J.B. Thompson. Prince Jeter, all those names sound familiar? All of them started at the House of Diggs, and all of them ended up opening up their own funeral homes. When we look at ladies, Pioneer, Suli Stinson, Annette Fields, Rebecca Barksdale, those are the trailblazers. When you look at O.H. Pye came from Barksdale. When you look at Hutchison, C.W. Morris. It's all tied together. 
March on Washington, everybody knows about that. The March on Washington was perfected in 1963, August. That's the famous I Have a Dream speech. And that's where Martin Luther King is standing. And if you look at it closely, you see Mahalia Jackson saying, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream, she's there to mourn. And that's when he went and said, I have a dream. But the first time he did it was in June of 1963. And they marched from Adams and Woodward to Cobo Hall. If you, if you look at the pictures, you'll see Martin Luther King arm in arm with two men. One man is C.L. Franklin, Aretha Franklin's father. The other man is Ben McFall. Now, what put this together, what put this together was the meetings at New Bethel Baptist Church, which was, which was Aretha Franklin's uh, father's church, and Macedonia, which was C.W. Morris's church. And C.W. Morris provided all the transportation the whole time that they were here putting this, this march together. And as we know, C.W. Morris is now uh, owned by James Henry uh, alumni and his two sons, Justin and Jimmy, follow his legacy. It all ties together. And we can, we can go to James H. Cole, that's 100 years. Now, there's some funeral homes that I'm going to name that was even before that, Bristol and Bristol. They're no longer. What were, what were some of the challenges that those first black funeral homes in Detroit would have faced? Where, where did their, their business come from? Was it from their church, from the pastors, from the neighborhood? When you look at, at churches... O'Neill Swanson, who I worked for for 20 years. When he came in the 50s, he opened up in 1958. He came right in the middle of the spiritual church movement. That was a very, very strong organization in the 50s. And the spiritual ministry, I'm speaking of Ralph Boyd. I'm speaking of King Narcissus. I'm speaking of Prophet Jones. I'm speaking of Sweet Daddy Grace, Father Divine. I say these names and great grandparents, their household names, but this was a movement that was very, very popular in the 50s. And Mr. Swanson's uh, aunt, Pat Lewis, was very involved. And she took him around as a young director. And they cradled him. And that, and that was a strong foundation of his business. That's where it started. McFaul Brothers, because of John Anderson, his, his uh, uh, brother was a bishop with the Church of God in Christ. I'm, I'm going in two different denominations. Uh, McFall was known as, as the Kojic Funeral Home, Church of God in Christ. These are denominations amongst African American Baptists, uh, C.O. Franklin was Baptist. The, it always started. I don't know if, I'm sure you've seen the fans. That's a history. No air condition. And we still do it today. I, I was going to, I was going to bring one of my fans. But that's a history. That's a business. Who made the fans? Matches when people smoke. Bonnets for the ladies here. Where do you pass a lot at in church? Who's selling dinner? The church selling dinner. Who's going to buy the dinner? The funeral director will buy the dinner. Who's going to eat? The community. It's going to be. 
that that fan is a is a great example of of something that's unique to African American services. Mm -hmm. And you talk about some other some other things that are unique to African American funeral services and and what's behind them. The emotion. See, this style of fame, I mean, you can go back 50, 60, 70 years. Now, this is 2021, but I mean, the same style. And you see them in church. I mean, Palm Sunday's coming up. I, I don't know if we'll be able to, to go. But this is a, it's a fiction. Now, back to your question. Okay, we're very emotional. The Africans talked about wearing the music, um, primarily gospel music, the B3 Hammond with the two Leslie speakers. There's one way that maybe a white singer will sing Amazing Grace, but there's another way that we sing Amazing Grace. I don't think nobody can sing Amazing Grace the way we can sing. The, the body, the presentation of the body, um, a climax of the service is the closing of the castle. I mean, it, it sounds my new, but, but that is like the, the strong point of an African-American service. The flower bed. Ladies sit in their pews, in their sanctuary, and they're honored to be a flower bearer. The obituary, we don't just do a single fold. You go to grandma's and, I want this one, you go to grandma's and they're in the, the Bible. That's our record. We now do books. That's our history. Totally different. If you want to offend somebody, don't give them an obituary of service. The repast, the food, breaking the bread is sacred. We come together. Remember Cooley High where they, they took a shot and then one for the person that's going on, that's symbolic. And the relationship has always been through the church. Even if a person didn't go to church, they want a minister to do it. Even if the person wasn't quote unquote religious, there has to be some type of religion inducted. The cars. Remember, I was talking about uh, when Martin Luther King called A.G. Gaston. It's something, I mean, on that day, those cars pull up to the house. It's something when Grandpa labored. Grandpa might not have been educated. Grandpa probably didn't make much, but on Sunday, Grandpa was a deacon, very well respected. You might not have seen him dressed unless it was on Sunday, unless it was at a wedding, or unless it was at a funeral. And it's something when Grandpa suffered with cancer and went from 200 pounds to 100 pounds. And the funeral director can prepare him and restore him and take him back to his church home one final time. We've seen many other cultures move away to a certain extent from having a viewing or having the body present at the service. Why is the body such an important part of African American funeral rituals? It's validation what's happened. It's the reality. See, 
the church deals with the spiritual. The funeral director deals with the physical. Just think if no one ever told us about Cicely Tyson making her transition, we could still be watching her movies and there's nothing to validate. It's the physical separation. It's that dress that you would see Auntie wear all of the time. It's something if you could see her laying in that dress, knowing that she's going to lay in that dress for eternity. If they can just look like they remember them to look one final time, it's just a physical separation. I want to take you back to 2005. We all know Rosa Parks and the important role that she played in civil rights in this country. Rosa Parks passed away in 2005. And out of all of the funeral directors in America, you were the person that was called on to care for her. Can you talk a little bit about how you got that call? How how you came to be the person who was selected and talk about how that made you feel? You know, I had actually, uh, that was October 24th, 2005. I had actually just finished uh, teaching in the lab at Wayne State when Mr. Swanson called me. And, um, summons me to come with him for us to uh, uh, serve their family. And I'm very guarded, and I'll say this, um, her family stressed to me that she was a very private person. And they asked me to uh, respect her privacy. And for the past 16 years, I've done it, and I continue to do that. But um, I'll say this. Um, when they asked Rosa Parks why she didn't give up her seat, she said she could close her eyes and she could see in the tears. I can see her in the interview saying that before she could answer, she would close her eyes and pause and say, I can just see the face of Emmett Till. We all know the story of Emmett Till. When Emmett Till was brought out of the waters after he was murdered, one of the people present, if you see the footage, was Mega Evers. Mega Evers was very, very involved when he was missing, very involved when his body was recovered. Mega Evers was murdered in his driveway eight years later. He was murdered by a white supremacist by the name of Byron Belladeckler. And he bragged about it. They would ask him about it and he would laugh and say, I can't say I killed him, but I can say he did. Well, finally, uh, he was brought to justice. And when they had this trial, they had to disinter Mecca's. And when he was disinterred, he was the same age as his son when he was killed, and they, they bear a very strong resemblance. And the embalming that embalmed Mecca was J.B. Thompson, a Wayne State graduate, class of 1943. J.B. Thompson is who taught me. So I feel a kinship because of J.B. Thompson and I feel a kinship because A.G. Gaston 
called William White, who was also uh, one of my teachers at Thomas. So it was a connection, and um, I just look at it as a full circle because I was very familiar with, with these tragedies. And um, when Mr. Swanson asked me to do it, I just saw it as a continuation of our struggle and our history. And can you talk a little bit about the services for, for Rosa Parks? She went to Washington, D.C., and then was brought back to Detroit for her funeral service and entombment. Were you involved in that? Yes. Uh, we did a private viewing. And then she was flown to Washington, where she laid in honor in the Capitol Rotunda. And uh, she was the first female to lie in honor in the Capitol Rotunda. And then, um, no, I take that back. She was first flown to Montgomery, where a funeral was held at St. Paul AME. And then from there, she was flown. She lied in state in the Capitol Rotunda, lied in honor in the Capitol Rotunda. And then a funeral was held at Metropolitan AME. And then she was flown back, where she lied in state at the Child Rights Right Museum for two days and then funeral services held at Greater Grace. And um, it's just ironic because um, when I was at the Charles H. Wright Museum and they brought her in, Secret Service was all around the building. And when I was opening the casket and preparing her for the public viewing, I could I knew somebody was standing behind me, but I really thought it was one of the secret secret service people. And finally, when the casket was open and she was ready for viewing, a very soft voice says to me, "She's beautiful." And when I turned, it was Cicely Tice. And it's just ironic that she just passed, but Cicely Tyson was the first person to see her once I opened her casket. But um, as you know, the service was eight hours and uh, the Clintons and uh, a young senator by the name of Barack Obama and and uh, Martin Luther King's daughter was there because at the time, um, Coretta Scott was, was ill and she passed a few months later. But it was, it was something to experience because there were so many people and it all came from her. I mean, you had kings and you had homeless people, but they all had to honor her because of what she did. I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't previously send to you. All of the history that you've talked about today with how services were handled during slavery and the first, few, first black funeral homes in America, the first black funeral homes in Detroit, all of that history, where it started. And I'm looking at that fan that you have in front of you on the table. How did it make you feel when one of those fans had your name on it? I just look at those before me. I just want to continue what they did. I want to preserve the dignity. I mean, we were one of the, we were like doctors. I mean, we had we had the the respect as doctors, as lawyers, as as true professionals, because we dealt 
with people at their lowest. I don't know anything worse than death. And I want the name to mean something. I mean, it, it's a simple fan, but I mean, when it's real hot, I mean, the comfort. When a person is viewing for the last time and the nurses take them, they give them water and they do this. It's comfort. This name only means something to me because it's my name, but I want it to mean something to them. That's what I see with this. It's not just advertising, it's so much. When the minister's delivering the eulogy, and the daughter is sitting there thinking about her father. She's doing this and does we can realize. It's a ritual. It is. Mr. Husband, would you be open to answering questions from the audience if there are any? Sure. Hi, my name is Elisa Kagan, and I want to thank you. This has been really, you know, fascinating to me. Um, when you were talking about the funeral homes that were in Detroit and thinking about during this time, during COVID, and so many people can't attend funerals, I seem to remember, and maybe it was even over 10 years ago, was there a funeral home, and I think maybe an African-American funeral home, that was innovative before their time, possibly that did a drive through viewing. And at the time people thought was, they were kind of mocking it, but for closure, and especially maybe now that'll be the wave of the future. I was just wondering if that is still go, if, if, that, if that's true. I can't remember if it, I think it was in Michigan, in Detroit. Yes. And you know, you know, the great thing is um, it's all tied to Wayne's faith. The funeral home that you're speaking of was at the time Frank Givens. Frank Givens was doing drive through funerals and viewings in the 70s. Frank Givens was at the corner of the 12th and Glendale. And in 19... 90, a Wayne State graduate, class of 86, Terrence Andrews, purchased Frank's Gibbons and now it's Andrews Funeral Home. Unfortunately, a car uh, hit the building and they had to uh, tear the building down and rebuild it. But the funeral home is still there. But that's where it actually was. And um, we have another graduate, uh, Miss Phillips, and I, I think it's Carlita Phillips. She came out in 2012. They have a funeral home in, uh, what is it? not Lansing. Saginaw? Saginaw, Saginaw. They have a funeral home in Saginaw. And two years ago, they just, they put a, a drive-in. So, um, yeah, they saw the future. But yeah, Frank Gibbons did it in, I think, 71, 72. You know, a good thing about COVID is, is you know, it's human nature when you're told you can't do something that you want to do. It. So, with so many people leaning towards the trend of they don't want a service, so many people doing COVID wanted to have a service and became creative in having a service. So that's one, I don't want to say good thing about COVID, but I would say that was one positive thing about COVID is the desire to have services. Hi, Mr. Husband. I'm, my name is Marissa. And I'm hoping that you could speak about your own personal experience and what brought you to your career. I, um, come May will be 40 years that I've been in funeral service, but what brought me into it, um, my father passed when I was 17. 
And um, I was extremely rebellious and very angry because I was the only person that had lost a fear. And in my anger, I was literally saying, wait until this person loses their father and this person loses their father. Then they'll know how it feels. I was having one of these moments and then I thought, when a person does experience something, they usually go to somebody who's experienced. So I went to Thompson and I asked them, I says, you know, what is it that you all hear from my father? So they kind of took me and, and, um, that was the beginning. And, um, I went to mortuary school and, uh, I worked for Thompson for 10 years. I worked for Swanson for 20 years. And this is my 10th year in business for myself. But um, I say to all of my students, I started teaching in 2000. And I, I said it then and I say it now. I quote Billy Holiday. And I asked the students, have you ever heard of him? Some have, some have not, but I can say, I'm on a quote here. You can't sing the blues until you feel the pain. So pain brought me into this, and I always remember how I felt. But um, the one thing that I always had, even when my father passed, was my mother. She was my greatest support. And seven years ago, uh, she passed, and funeral service now is even more different than it was then. I thought I had a really un understanding of pain and really helping people at their lowest, but doing this without her is even a, even a greater experience. It's the one thing that I don't encourage people to go into for money. I don't encourage them to go into it to, to get fame or anything like that. The only way, the only way to do it is to empathize, not sympathize, empathize with what they're experiencing. That's the only way. Thank you so much. Roger, I, I just have to say there are a lot of words that I could use to describe you, but Rebellious is not one that would come to mind first. That moment. I had a question. I'm Vicki Tutiglier from Pharmacy Practice. And I believe if I wasn't a pharmacist, I would be a mortician. I was always fascinated with funerals and the process of the funeral service. I'm Polish Catholic, so one of my earliest memories was being held over someone's casket and praying. And um, I was always taught. Don't be afraid of the dead. Um, and, you know, the preparation of all my aunties, you know, everyone I know who's still surviving has their, you know, Sunday best picked out their funeral dress. You know, remember, they tell me, Victoria, this is my funeral dress. Remember, and mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very big ritual for us. And But I've seen changes throughout the decades and years. Um, and I see it as a process that people want to rush through. I remember the two or three day viewings as a child or a younger person. Now it's barely a day. Um, I don't know if you could comment on um, some changes you have seen in your practice or in you know the practice of funerals throughout the decades. Well, the truth is nobody wants to go to a funeral. Nobody wants to experience death. But when you look at cultures that educate about the grieving process, they look at it differently. Nobody wants to pay for something they don't want. And nobody wants to call a funeral home. There's hope when you call any other business but there's no hope when you have to make that initial call to the funeral. And I understand that. But you have to see the value 
And unfortunately, we as professionals have not educated people of the value of the grieving process. And it's human nature to avoid that which is not good. It's easier to run, to avoid it. So we come up with ways where you don't have to face it. But grieving is healthy and it's important. 1963, one of the greatest mistakes was made. 1963, November 22nd, that was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. When Jackie stood with a blood-stained dress, emotionless, and little John Jones saluted his father's casket, and they said, look at her. That's how you grieve. And they took this picture and they showed it to the world and said, this is how you should grieve. And if you get the Ebony Magazine of 1968, there's a picture of Perez Scott King sitting with a veil at Martin Luther King's funeral with her child laying in her lap. And they said it again, just as Jackie grieved so beautifully. Coretta did the same thing. And in 1993, it was revealed that Jackie never resolved from grief. And in 2006, it was revealed that Coretta Scott King never resolved her grief. We've totally turned it in the wrong direction and said to grieve is to not show emotion. Is to not weep. It's to move on. And what's the best way? We don't need to do a funeral. Let's get away from it. We'll have a party. But see, the reality is still there. And I don't care if you don't have but a second. That second is eternity. When you think and you have to deal with what's happening. But we have not educated people of the process and the value of grief. That is just as important as a good diet. When we interview students to come into the mortuary science program, we always ask them, why do you want to do this? Or what got you interested in, in funeral service? And I've had a number of those students say, well, Mr. Husband did a talk at our high school, or Mr. Husband did a talk when I took a, a seventh grade class. And so why, why is it so important to you to do those types of things? You've been doing that for probably over 20 years, speaking to, to high school classes and, and different groups of young people about funeral service. Why is that important? When the when the senior dies, it's like burning down a library. The worst thing you can do is destroy a library or destroy the cemetery because that's your history. It's not yours exclusively. It has to be shared. That's the only way that knowledge has any value is if it's shared. Because if you keep it to yourself, then you become arrogant. Then you get an ego. And all that means is egging God out. Because the generations have to pass it on to the unborn generations. Any other questions for Mr. Husband? I just have one quick one, because I'm just so curious. You know, so so my dad was in the restaurant business. He couldn't get either of, one, of us to go into his business. But it always seems like in your business, it's always a family affair. Like the sons go into the business, et cetera. I've noticed that they're all different nationalities and cultures. Is that, um, I mean, I was just wondering, are your kids 
or wife or what have you, family members in your business? Yes, actually, uh, my daughter is. Uh, but I didn't, I have two kids and I never uh, encourage either one because um, it's a lifestyle. And if you do it for any other reason, it's it's not going to work. So I never, ever encouraged them. And, you know, my daughter came to me and said she wanted to come into it. And she, she graduated last year. So she's with them. But um, you're not helping the kid uh, if they go into it and they really don't want to do it. Because who really suffers are the family. What we do, most of what we do, people don't see it. They don't see it. They don't know. So there has to be trust. And you can't question trust. Example, there was a young girl that passed. She was five years old. And for five years, she was sick. And when I met with the family, they brought back two big teddy bears and a comforter. So I asked them, I said, you want this in the casket? They said, no. They said, she was sick for five years. And what gave her comfort was a teddy bear under each arm and the comfort. We want you to have this with her until she's placed in her cancer. We just can't picture her on a cold table. They gave me the comforter, the two teddy bears. And they never asked me about it. Never asked me to this day. So you all may ask me, well, did you do it? And the politically correct thing to say is, yes, I did. I'm not going to say I didn't do it. You all know if I'm telling the truth or not. They never asked me. Only I know if I did or if I did not. The question is, if I didn't, then what would that say about me? And they never asked. That's the trust. Mr. Husband, I want to thank you so much again for taking the time to to spend with us this afternoon and, and give us some history and really important history here. Dr. Frady, do you have any closing remarks? Only that I'm so very, very happy and proud to see uh, my dear friend back with us again and speaking. Um, Roger, I've got to tell you, uh, don't make yourself a stranger, my brother. You've been very close to me personally, and uh, what you've done for funeral service, especially in the African-American community, is profound. And I, for one, and I, I'm sure I speak for the, my entire uh, group of uh, colleagues at the college, how happy we are that you were with us today and gave such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I love the, the walk down history lane, the names of the funeral homes of McCall brothers and their like. They mean a lot to me because I remember every time I would go to Woodlawn Cemetery, I'd see the beautiful processions coming in uh, with the funeral coach and, and something we don't see much today, flower cars. And 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 certainly uh, this is a walk down history lane. So thank you again. And uh, thank everybody for coming today for this, again, our very, very first uh, meeting uh, celebrating Black History Month. So thank you again.